Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I'm about to do something dangerous, and that is to give my observations and reflections to some of the ideas of Sheikh uh, Umar Suleiman. Sheikh Umar Suleiman is a great scholar of Islam. I have actually listened to two of his lectures, and I benefited from both of them. One lecture was on Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, and one lecture was uh, about Qiyam uh, al uh, And I benefited, alhamdulillah, and uh, I believe uh, Shaykh Umar Suleiman is extremely, extremely intelligent, and uh, I believe he's sincere. And I, am belie I believe he's going on a path that's very difficult and in which you have to work a lot harder than the fruits you get. However, I disagree with his political framework that he is kind of like using as maybe his model to how he wants to engage uh, with the world around him. So I think the best and the most fair way uh, is to let Sheikh Omar Suleiman say his ideas and I'll give my reflections. And by the way, there are things that Sheikh Omar Suleiman in this speech, he says that are absolutely fabulous and gems. So it's not like uh, I totally disagree with him, but I think some of the ideas are misplaced. And so uh, in the... Uh, spirit of exchanging ideas and in this case I'm doing this because I think that because the framework has some uh, problems in it that it is going to lead to uh, many uh, it's going to be disaster it could be disastrous in my opinion it could be disastrous okay so to be fair inshallah ta'ala I'm going to let Sheikh Umar Suleiman uh, mention his ideas and then I will respond to them as he's speaking uh, and and then and, and to the parts that I agree I will say I agree with this this is fabulous this is great alhamdulillah right um, he's definitely much more pious than me much more knowledgeable th than me uh, he has a better understanding of, of issues than I do but again uh, I'm you know I have been studying the deen since I was young and been engaged in Islamic work all my life so I also have certain feelings and opinions and uh, deen nasiha deen is sincere advice so if somebody can get this talk of mine to Sheikh Omar Sulaiman please do so okay so this is what I'm hoping I'm hoping this will be my way of inshallah ta'ala let, let Sheikh Omar Sulaiman also see the other point of views maybe you know uh, so so let us inshallah ta'ala uh, so forward this to as, as as many people as you like um, particularly if this topic interests you so what we're going to he's going to talk about his framework of how he sees alliances and coalitions and uh, particularly Sheikh Omar Suleiman working with the Democratic Party in the USA and you know um, kind of like um, Bernie Sanders and all of that is that a good thing is it not a good thing what's the framework how should we look at this Islamically so he's discussing this and I'm going to give my responses to some of those points that he made makes and um, I would even say that at some level he destroys his own framework by mentioning certain realities that exist which you will see Okay, Bismillah, Inshallah, uh, and I pray to Allah that uh, no one sees this me as attacking Sheikh Omar Suleiman because who am I, you know? And uh, <clears throat> and number two, that while listening to him, uh, if if he said something right, Allah opens my heart, and uh, if I say something right, may Allah convey my message to him, uh, Inshallah Taala. Okay, so now. Having said that, let us continue with his talk.
Hebrew text and, and Old Testament literature. It's not just, you know, we can still be social justice oriented, but just not on these issues. Let's talk about what we are first and what we can do and what we operate out of in terms of a framework. And then see where there are negotiables and non-negotiables and where there's room for compromise, where there is not room for compromise. But so he's talking about the fact he's going to talk about a framework, about making alliances, coalitions, what is, you know, and, and he's using an article written by a, a Jewish gentleman uh, who, who has written a pretty good article, actually. And uh, so, uh, you know, he's, he's going to give the framework now. With that goal of um, committing ourselves to a better humanity, so level one, level one. All right, so now we're going to build. So now he's going to build this framework, okay? We kind of put those aside, what we should be committed to in terms of rhetoric and approach. Number one, engaging the broadest coalitions possible to advance social change of benefit to everyone or that remove an imminent harm, poverty, homelessness, public education, the mistreatment of migrants at the border. I, I want to start off by, by saying that one of the reasons why we're so po polarized as a society is because platforms have become broader. You have to commit to an issue, tw these 20 issues, and you can only find this many people willing to commit to those 20 issues. If you uh, endorse 17 of those 20, you're not welcome, right? So what, what type of societal friction and tension is that meant to create? So start off with this. How do you form the broadest coalitions possible, all right? where you bring as many people to the table as possible around things that are neither, you know, particularly liberal or conservative. They're just good for society and good for people, <coughs> right? You know, ho homelessness, who's going to say that we should not do, we should not treat the homeless more humanely. We should not think about policy that, uh, that that's better for them. Who's going to say that we shouldn't have better public education, at least outright? Who's going to say that we shouldn't combat poverty and try to figure out a way to uplift the poor in society. Um, and, and I use mistreatments at the, of the migrants at the border from personal experience, by the way. Um, alhamdulillah, I've been to the border many times. I've been to El Paso, I've been to Juarez, I've been to Tijuana, I've been to San Diego, I've been to McAllen, um, all of these different border entry points. And subhanAllah, what I noticed the more and more that I started going is that you had conservative religious groups that were willing to actually come down. And the, the statement that I will never forget by a conservative religious leader, and I use the term conservative not as like a super alt-right, you know, I'm, I'm conservative in that socially conservative, not politically liberal, does not like um, the presidential candidate that Sheikh Yasser Qadi was talking about, Pete Buttigieg, does not like, none of you guys caught that, post-Samosa, all right, does not like any of them. Uh, thinks Democrats are ruining the country, thinks liberals are dangerous and, and cannibalizing, like has all those perceptions. And subhanAllah, the word that he said really, really, really touched me. He said that I'm coming down not because I agree with your policy proposals, but this isn't it. Putting kids in cages, the way that we're treating people at the border, unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. And so when Oak Lawn United Methodist Church opens up a refuge center, uh, asylum for some of the migrants that we were able to get permission to, to take from the Annunciation House, which is a Catholic refuge center at El Paso. You had all types of religious groups come together to provide better accommodations for them, to provide cots, to provide lunch, to provide uh, whatever it is, to the Greyhound, the hotels, whatever it needed, whatever needed to be to get people where they need to get to. So even on an issue that can be polarizing, um, you'll find people that just from a human bare humanitarian uh, or from a basic place of humanitarianism, will not find that they're able to sleep at night, right, with, with the things that are taking place in this country. Now, some would say, if you read social movement theory, some would say broad coalitions don't work because the issues that they champion end up being immaterial. They're not real issues because in order to build broad consensus, you have to shy away from the things that really need to be spoken about and really be dealt with. The thing about that, unless those issues are so deep that they cut across identities in a society. And if you think about the issues that I just mentioned, they do cut across all identities in America right now. We are in, you know, we're in a situation of emergency. We have some of the worst statistics of poverty in, of, of the developed world. Okay? As far as the gap is concerned, America literally leads the world 
in the poverty in, in the wealth gap, right? And what that means in terms of healthcare, what that means in terms of some of those other uh, things that are that are uh, important for us to come uh, to come together on. So that's level one, broadest coalition, common sense issues. What would stop you, as a Muslim who abides by the Sunnah? from engaging those things heavily, not because they're good PR, but because you believe that's what the Prophet ﷺ would have called you to do. What stops us from that? And I give the example of the Sikh community. I, you know, SubhanAllah, after Hurricane Katrina, those people, I saw them in New Orleans, the Sikh community, do things that I did not see from any other community. It was zeal, it was, it was, a, special, it was a special type of energy that they brought to the, to, the, to the process of refuge and to the process of rehabilitating uh, the refugees and the evacuees from Hurricane Katrina, right? Where are Muslims in those activities? Don't you think building that goodwill allows you to have a more authoritative voice on some of the more difficult conversations that I'm about to get to? So here, um, everything he said so far is good. But I would like to make a distinction between two things. One is a social movement, a grassroots movement. Okay, a grassroots movement is social movement, um, different from electoral politics, and from the uh, so so the mechanisms of a social movement, and mechanisms of people running a movement to help people that are um, underprivileged, to people helping the homeless people, running a grassroots movement, a volunteer movement, is is has is a different phenomenon from when you are doing electoral politics and the effect of that. If you take a bunch of Muslims, because this is going to be very important as we as he develops this framework of, of, of his, inshallah. And if you take a bunch of Muslims and tell them, okay, these are non-Muslims, they're hurt, let's help them. It has a very different impact upon the children compared to, which is really where I'm trying to go with a lot of this, if you take them to a conference of LGBT, uh, gay lesbian uh, pride, you go to a great gay lesbian pride conference and other Muslim youth come there and, and, and you're going to give this broad speech, right, about rights and human rights and so on and so forth and the gays are thinking that they're the people whose rights have been taken. And in that Democratic Party, while there are many, you could say, um, small groups, right? There, the, the, there are many uh, groups that are there just because, you know, they're, 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 they're not the major voice, right? And, and, and the LGBT community, the gay lesbian community is a major voice in the, in, in the Democratic Party. It's kind of like in fiqh, in Islamic law, if there's a majority of something, right? There's a majority of something and there's slight, like let's say uh, there's a piece of cloth with a border of uh, silk, but it's very, very small. Some of the fuqaha will allow it. Okay, that's fine. It's not really, it, it's, it's, it's tabir, they, some of the scholars call it. So in the same way, you know, you're in this big, and these Muslim youth are coming listening to you, and uh, and and that has a very negative effect upon them in terms of oh, you know, and Muslims come out thinking, okay, well, this is how it's supposed to be. This is the movement we're running, where we're becoming more liberal ourselves. It's a matter of who is, and and and, and so let's listen to what Sheikh Mursaliman says. But I just want to bring this out: is that there is a difference between a grassroots movement and a political movement. Okay, there is a, and what did the Prophet do? The Prophet ﷺ ran a grassroots movement. Essentially, it was a social movement. It was a movement from the ground up. Okay, it was an intellectual, educational, social movement that that put pressure upon that society. That said, "Bi ayyidan bin qutilat." For what reason have you killed this child, girl? Araita aladhi yukadzibu bidin, fadalik aladhi yadu'u aliyatim. Have you seen the one who pushes, who denies the day of judgment? He's the one who pushes the orphan. Wailu lil mutafifin. Destruction on those who are unfair in their businesses. The point here is that is a social movement. Okay, and the Prophet ﷺ really shied away in his seerah when it came to like this type of electoral will be make you you know will give you this um, you could say uh, a kind of like a coalition that was artificial. 
uh, that had more to do with power than anything else. So let's continue listening, inshallah. Right, if you were present, not just for the press conference, present for the hard work in these issues, don't you think people would take you more seriously and people would have a more difficult time demonizing you, right? For your scriptural commitment. Of course, but that's a social movement. And now somehow there is this jump from a social movement to political activism, as, as you'll see, that will be mentioned. And for the way that you abide by the sunnah of the Prophet So that's level one. There's no disagreement there. When the Quran said, for what reason you killed this child girl? It wasn't talking to Muslims. It was talking to everybody. Right? So we have to stand up for the, what is right in society. And join the good, forbid the evil that is at the broadest, uh, not at the broadest level in the, in the sense that Sheikh Suleiman is saying, but it's something that affects the entire society. Of course we have to do that. Level two, uh, joining or engaging coalitions that are for the sake of social cohesion, uh, unity, general welfare, harmony, civil discourse, uh, and coexistence. Broader picture, um, you know, wh where these things are actually being discussed about how we, how we come to a place where we can agree to disagree, live and let live, but not in a way that's hateful or everyone go back to their corner. But if the city of Plano was to form some sort of a welcoming cities, I don't know if you guys have a welcoming cities committee here in Plano, they do in Dallas, and it brought together many different communities and talked about how to make Plano a more inclusive place, a more uh, harmonious place. Obviously, I think Muslims should be at the table uh, for those things. As far as civil discourse is concerned, um, I'd really recommend you guys look up Cornell West and Robert George, who are on the opposite ends of the political spectrum. Uh, Robert George, who advances socially conservative positions, um, but has horrible positions on issues like Palestine, right? Uh, Cornell West, who has wonderful positions on Palestine, um, is, is, you know, uh, politically liberal. And just I, these ideas of creating forums and fostering forums on civil discourse. How do we as Americans, right, learn to live with one another in peace without demonizing one another? Now, to bring this out of like that big realm, how do you engage your diversity and inclusion groups at work? How many of you have diversity and inclusion groups at your workplace? Can you raise your hands? So you don't sit those out because you say, I'm a Muslim, I can't be at that place. So I'm not going to engage diversity and inclusion because, you know, there's, there's other groups that are there. You know, if I do that, then, you know, what's going to happen with the LGBT group? What's going to happen with... I think this is, this statement is a very big mistake. And that is for this reason. Like, if I'm a computer engineer at my work, I'm my identity is as a computer engineer. Everyone that, like, if you work in corporate America, right, when you work in corporate America, your identity is your function. He's the engineer, he's the accountant, he's this. You're not coming as a representative of your religion. So this guy is, let's say he is the accountant, but he happens to be gay, right? And this person's a... A computer engineer and he happens to be, he happens to be Muslim but that's not the dominant identity within the company the dominant identity within the company is the role that you're playing as the accountant as the computer engineer as the you know uh, instructor or trainer whatever it is number one number two in a company when you come together to discuss diversity and sensitivity sensitivity the training and cultural sensitivity and all these things. When you come together at, at the company level, you're on equal footing with all your colleagues. You're on equal footing with all your colleagues. When you go to a democratic convention as Muslim, the Muslim caucus, and we're going to talk about that, boy oh boy. When you go to a Muslim, as Muslim representatives within a, a, the democratic party, you're not on equal footing. You're not on equal footing to anybody. I mean, not the dominant culture, not to the establishment. So that's one. And then number two, you're not going there as your role of, like you're here at an accountant or a computer engineer. You're not going as your work role. And then you're sitting together with colleagues that are of equal status with you. You're going there as the underprivileged because the Democratic Party is all about the underprivileged. That's why the black community is with the Democrats. That's why the Hispanic community is with the Democrats. That's why the Muslim community wants to be with the Democrats right now. 
<coughs> but even though the dominant voice belongs to a few, right? The dominant voice belongs to the LGB community on the one side, and then some Jewish groups on the other side, you know, and, but the, the rest of the, you know, the, the Christian churches that you're talking about, that are socially active in terms of social justice, they have, there's Christians, but they're not Republicans, which is an oddity, right? Even though they're not, but they are the oddballs in that group. So just keep this in mind. With this group and that group. You don't do that, right? You engage it thoughtfully, thoroughly. Uh, you try your best to make the best of that situation. If there's a, uh, an effort like that that's at a school and things of that sort, then obviously, um, you know, Muslims will naturally engage those things in ways that are uh, beneficial and not so deeply problematic. Level three, this is where we're starting to get specific and it starts to get tricky. Joining or engaging coalitions that address specific issues, specific issues that are about harm reduction, but they are politicized in their nature. Criminal justice reform, police brutality, militarism, healthcare, environmentalism, ecological justice. These are things that are very political or they're very politicized, even though they are about harm reduction. Okay? So, when Muslims engage those things, how do they engage those things thoughtfully, thoroughly? Again, the more specific the issue, the more specific the issue, the less problematic it is who, you know, what the allyship is and who's around the table. We're here to do this. We're here for this issue because this is an issue that means something to us. Outside of the political realm, because I want you guys to think about, again, your own lifestyles and not just uh, be critiquing leaders, but also thinking about your own life, your own lives and the things that you might engage in your family lives. Um, safety measures in schools, if there was a PTO that came together that formulated to tackle certain issues in school, are you going to say that, well, if these people are at the table, I'm not going to sit there? No, you're going to be there because the PTO is addressing X, Y, Z, and it's important. Now, on these issues that are... Again, I think this is the same mistake, which is when you are part of a PTO, you're a member of that, you're on equal footing because your child is going to the same school as anyone else's child. Um, I think that, uh, again, so, so number one, there's not equal footing, and number two, there's a difference between, uh, you know, a kind of like a social movement versus a political movement. Organizations like the PTA, PTO, uh, where parent-teacher organizations come together, and discuss issues, right? You don't say, I'm not going to go because X, Y, Z. It's different. The reason it's different is because, let's say, if the issue is bullying, right? Somebody's bullying, bullying someone else's child, and I go there. <coughs> I'm going there because I want to go there, and he's going there because he wants to go there. I don't need a large, I don't, I, we're not counting votes. And we're not looking at majority or minority. Everyone is voicing their opinions. So, so there is a big difference. Um, I think that is a bad example for what is going to be the end result of this framework. Specifically about harm reduction, how do we engage them thoughtfully? Number one, I still think we, we speak from a place of khidmah, a place of service, charitable endeavors within these areas, which is the least political form of these politicized issues. All right. So, for example, alhamdulillah, I had the, the blessing of, of uh, starting Muslims for Migrants with Imam Zaid Shakir through Celebrate Mercy. And we literally paid bail bonds, freed people, alhamdulillah, that were uh, held in, in, my, in custody, reunited them with their families. This is something that, by the way, and subhanAllah, I... And this is great. But again, this is like a social movement. It's not a political movement. So, when you confuse social movement and political movement and try to bring the strategies of the social movement into and try to like just pose that upon a political movement you're going to have it, it, it's going to have a it could have a negative con consequence especially in the case of the uh the muslims i can't tell i, I don't want to go into it because of the time I can't tell you how many stories what it's like to see a parent that got snatched away for something so silly something so insignificant you know i was on my way to to class um a few months ago with a brother and there was 
and I'm not making this up. There's a rainbow in the sky. I'm not talking about the flyers, all right? An actual rainbow. No one painted a rainbow in the sky. There's a rainbow in the sky. And so everyone that's driving by is looking at the rainbow in the sky. And as we're looking at them, like, subhanAllah, boom, got rear-ended on the highway. All right? I'm on my way to class, and the brother who was driving the car, I was a passenger, had to make a decision because the guy came out, 21 years old, crying. I mean, crying begging for forgiveness, saying, look, I'm undocumented. My paper's expired. I have a three-year-old daughter, pulled out the pictures, said if the police come, I'm going to jail. I'm not making this up. Please, and I thought, how miserable of an existence does that have to be that you have to worry about something like that, especially with SB4 where the police can act like ICE agents and enforce that, right? Just because he was looking at the rainbow, got distracted for a moment, boom, right? So charitable endeavors within these areas, that's number one. Number two, prophetic paradigms. Being very intentional about your present there because the sunnah calls you to be there in this, 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 and this act issue, right? You don't just give religious languaging to something that's not religious at all. You're actually there because you need to be there. Um, and this is where there's an important distinction here within uh, dhulm, within transgression and uh, in, in the shari sense. Shirk. In the shirka, the zulmun azim, right? Shirk is, is a great transgression, right? But at the same time, it took the Sahaba time to formulate that understanding of shirk. Everything, if you do zulm to yourself, when you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a form of zulm. There are societal transgressions, al fawahish, right? Those immoralities and things of that sort in society, that's a form of zulm. But then there is a specific form of zulm which is ta'addi which is the transgression upon another person which speaks to a basic sense of fitrah. Okay? So the scholars, for example, will mention the distinction between what Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said about zina and khamar versus waydun lil mutaffifin and wa idha al-ma'uda tusu'ilat bi aydhan bin qutilat. So let me break it down. Ta'addi, basic transgression, one of the first revelations was Allah condemning the people for female infanticide, burying their girls alive. You don't need a long construction to understand why this is problematic and wrong and deeply oppressive. Waylun lil mutaffifin, cheating with the weights, you really don't need a long construction to really understand this. That's ta'addi and it is the transgression of other people's rights. The other thing, what did Aisha radiallahu anha say? If the first ayah to be revealed was, do not drink alcohol, the people would have said, Wallahi, we'll never stop drinking alcohol. And if the first ayah to be revealed was, do not commit zina, the people would have said, Wallahi, we'll never stop committing zina. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave tawheed, spirituality, these reminders of the hereafter. A greater longing that causes us to channel our desires to that longing. All right. One of the people I gave uh, shahada to, he's a, he's a rapper, and I've made it a, a lesson to never reveal the names of them anymore because then people go and harass them and say, "I heard about your shahada story." All right. So Subhanallah, he said, he said, "Look, I can be Muslim, can't stop eating pork. I love my bacon too much. Okay, I'll be Muslim, but my bacon, gotta have my bacon." You know, it's before Impossible Meat and Beyond Meat, and Zabiha bacon still doesn't taste all that good, right? Sometimes the turkey bacon, but it was like shahawat, right? Those Primarily, those things arise from shahawat, lusts and desires that get channeled into all types of sexualities, into all types of actions in society. And you've got to teach people to aim and long for something greater, right? To long for something greater. Now, can we just say as Muslims, we're only going to engage on the ta'addi part? No, because harm reduction is only one part of our Muslim moral framework. Our Muslim moral framework involves more than just oppression and harm. But oppression and harm is the most common sense, deeply rooted, that you, you can engage other people. When the Prophet ﷺ engaged in hilf al-fudul, if you go back and you watch the 40 hadith on social justice that I did with Yaqeen, uh, hilf al-fudul, which was the league of the just that the Prophet ﷺ uh, formulated, did something happen? Or we got more guns coming. Okay. The security stuff is new to me. I'm not used to this. All right. So the Prophet ﷺ engaged before Islam in Hilf al-Fudul, which was that the tribes came together. And I'm paraphrasing this whole lecture with all the lessons and fawa'at. It's from Hilf al-Fudul. The tribes came together before Islam, five prominent tribes, and took an oath that they will protect the vulnerable amongst them, those from the lower tribes or the tribeless or the visitors and the foreigners. 
meaning that their hukuk, their rights would not be taken away from them without everyone standing for them when those rights were taken. Primarily, this is in the realm of economic transgression, right? So, you um, here I think uh, Sheikh Umar Suleiman makes uh, a few big mistakes. Number one, that was a social movement, not a political movement. What the Prophet did uh, before he was a Prophet. Number two, he did this before he was a Prophet. And what did he say after he conquered Mecca? After he conquered Mecca, he said, if today someone calls me for, for Half al-Fudul, I will support that. My point being is, the methodology the Prophet used وسلم, prior to being a Nabi to stand up for justice, okay, and creating this charter that we will fight for the rights of people was, was a social movement. But the type of social movement the Prophet had after he became a Prophet, right, was was of a very, it was a very different, it was a very revolutionary type of social movement. So when the Prophet changed everything after Fatul Makkah, then he said, okay, now these things we can now do that. So anyway, <coughs> so because there, there's the, the system and the laws, right? If the system is bad and you have the best laws, it still won't work. And so uh, th that is for a bigger topic, but uh, let's continue. You owe someone money, uh, forget you, you don't belong to this tribe, what are you going to do about it? Okay? The Prophet ﷺ was part of Hilf al-Fudul and he said after Islam, he said that there is nothing more beloved to me. He, he described it more beloved than a valley of red camels, which is the way that you describe uh, uh, love uh, for something. Then this Hilf, this oath, this pledge that we took before Islam. And he said, Wallahi, if I'm called to it again, then I will respond to it again. And one of the, the blessings of that. He said this to Prophet after Islam was established. Because now that Islam is established, you can really act upon it. Which is a, a, a very important point as you will see as we have this discussion. That uh, Ibn Battal rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned of that. He said that one of the implications of that was that Muslims, when the Prophet ﷺ said that, he's in a position of power. Okay, meaning when the Prophet ﷺ, when you're on the vulnerable side of society, it's beneficial, it makes sense to engage in those types of pacts and relationships. But now you're powerful, now you're, you have the upper hand, so you could say, deal with it, right? The Prophet ﷺ engages as such. The point here is, the Prophet established the Sharia and now he's able to do this good. The, to assume this, uh, it's very important to understand the Prophet said this after the conquest of Mecca, after the establishment of Islam. Not before, he didn't say it in, Ma he didn't say it in Medina. He didn't say it in, in the early years of Mecca. He said it after he became powerful. And so therefore that, that whole argument itself kind of like, to me at least, implodes. It's common sense. You don't bear the shirk, the zina, the, you know, the, the, the adultery, the, the, the fornication, the alcoholism, all the stuff that the Arabs were doing, aside from idol worship, that stemmed from idol worship, to, uh, to participate in that type of a pledge, because it's specific to be anti-ta'addi, which is a very specific form of oppression. But, as we said, our moral framework, and I don't have time to go into moral foundations theory, our moral framework has more than oppression and harm to it, right? So, what about the entirety of the framework? What about lusts and desires? What about, you know, uh, committing to celibacy? What about committing, you know, outside of nikah, right? What about committing ourselves to abandoning alcohol and things of that sort? The spirit of achieving the entire framework should be from a place of concern and wanting good for people. Whether we're doing khidmah to them, service for Allah, or calling them to Allah, it should come up from a place of concern and well-being. That this is for your benefit. This isn't to shame or to put people down. This is for the longing of something greater. And I want to actually speak to Malcolm from a, philosopher, from, a, from, from a philosophical perspective. When Malcolm left the Nation of Islam, he formed Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And he said, this will give us a religious base and the spiritual force necessary to rid our people of the vices that destroy the moral fiber of our community. So Malcolm said, you can't separate political oppression this is, very, uh, this is very important, by the way. You can't separate political oppression from, from social degradation, from economic exploitation. Political oppression, social degradation, economic exploitation. This is actually a very, very interesting and a very important point. And 
I would even add, based upon something Shaulila Muhaddas Dilwi Rahmatullah has mentioned, spiritual degradation. And he said the genius of the nation of Islam was it was able to take people and have them commit to this entire framework. Right? So it wasn't just about reclaiming black power and pushing back on the racial injustices towards black people in America. It was able to get them to commit to these, these very high standards because they believed in something. And over here is another, uh, I could say, um, flaw in the argument. Over here, Sheikh Suleiman is saying very, very correctly that you need a you need a framework that's comprehensive. You need a framework that's able to see how the different aspects, the political, economic, social aspects, all spiritual, all of this fits together, right? The problem with the electoral process, especially in the current syst in the current environment where Muslims are in. And where they are cheering, you know, cheerleading for the Democratic Party. It's like you have, instead of being, instead of having a comprehensive view of, of issues, right? You're just supporting the Democratic Party blindly, not because it fits under some broad scheme of how things comprehensively fit each other, but because you hate Trump. So therefore, we're going to go with the Democrats, even if the result of being with the Democrats is that it has a negative impact upon the Muslim youth by seeing us stand up. It's almost like we're standing up together with, with, with morals and I, because the Democratic Party is the, is the, is the party that's an atheist, right? It's the party that's run by the atheists. It's run by the gays and lesbians. And then you have, churches and minorities and things like that that are a little bit more progressive they're not like the conservative evangelical christians on the republican side and and we will be like one of those small groups that have never gotten anything from the whole process of joining them or being part of them right <coughs> so um okay let's just continue here right so malcolm wanted to recreate basically a sunni version of the nation of islam he wasn't able to do so Okay, Muslim Mosque Incorporated only got a hundred or so members, so he, form, he formed OAAU, Organization for Afro-American Unity, which was a broader umbrella where more people can come under po similar political ideals and they could work together. Similar political ideals as a social movement, not as a political movement. And his ideal was that he said the Muslim Mosque Incorporated members would be so committed to those causes that they would naturally show people that the solution to racism in America is Islam. So, what Good point, but again, as a social movement, not as a political movement. This is a key point. Now other key points are coming. While they're working under OAAU, the broader umbrella, they'll see the beauty of Islam through the commitment of the Muslims, the zeal of the Muslims, right? And that would make them long for the other side of those things. So how do we draw out a Tawheed-centric uh, uh, framework that helps us understand that not every objective of the deen is going to be attained, by the way, through politics, alliances, and coalitions. So here, now he comes to specifically talking about politics for the first time. Okay, And, and, and there's another uh, issue here that's very, very important that I'll bring up in a second. Right? Ilhan Omar and Rashida uh, Tlaib getting... Oh, two minutes. Oh, man. All right. Did you send them? All right. Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib is not إِذَا جَاءَ نَصُّ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ All right? It's not every objective of the deen is going to be achieved through politics, alliances, and coalitions. Da'wah still has its place. Calling people to Allah into a better way has to still happen. Tawheed still is our primary concern. All of that which is good... This is so... Beautiful what Sheikh Omar Suleiman just mentioned. But here's the thing. There's also something in fiqh called fiqh al-awliyat. The fiqh of priorities. If your da'wah, if you're in your priorities, if you want to think about a comprehensive framework, like we were talking about in terms of you have to have a social movement like Malcolm X did, that was not just talking about racism, but was also then able to identify how that oppression led to an economic problem, which then also led to other problems. And now he, he was trying to use Nation of Islam to cure not just the problem of racism, but also he was trying to 
address the issue of poverty and other issues that happened in his community, a comprehensive view. Now, in that comprehensive view, when we look at it as Muslims, right, for asking Muslims to vote Democrat, which would divide us anyway, because many Muslims will report, vote for Republican anyway. But, but going further than that, when you have this comprehensive view, you should. There's also this thing called that I was talking about, that I'm talking about fiqh al But if your da'wa base is not strong, meaning the the da'wa base is not strong, your spiritual base is not strong, your unity base as Muslims is not strong. And then now you're engaging in this because it just seems, you know, easy to do. Um, is is not going to yield any long-term good results, especially when Muslims see, for example, Umar Ilhan. May Allah bless her. She's the congresswoman, but you know she supports LGBT, and she goes to these uh, drag queen things. That sends a wrong, you know, I, she, she can be doing it with the good intentions, and you know, with the intention of that, whatever it is, I don't know. But the point is. Her going there sends the wrong message to a lot of the Muslim youth that are already on the fringes of, they're already on the fence, and they already have a negative view of Islam, and now they see this, so now their Islam becomes diluted. And that's the part I think uh, Sheikh Umar Suleiman is not seeing. That how this affects the audience that is not the dominant culture but the audience that is the subculture being affected by the dominant culture and bad in accordance with our divine <laughs> revelation is worth challenging society with so what that means is my commitment to societal justice does not mean that i relinquish my commitment to da'wah and vice versa those things do go hand in hand not hand in hand there's priorities if you don't have, you cannot have a strong social, proper social grassroots movement if you don't have the proper priorities. All right, level four, coalitions with faith groups that share our concerns, commitments, or plights. 68% of Latinos, as I mentioned, identify as Roman Catholic. The AME Church, the Church of Rosa Parks, the Civil Rights Church, the church that brought together black liberation theology, also a socially conservative church, by the way, Orthodox Jews, when's the last time you saw a Muslim interfaith all right, with a religious group that shares the dual burden that we do of being racialized and discriminated against as well as having religious commitments that make things uncomfortable for them wherever they may be? So building those types of alliances. All right, I'm going through. Level five, engaging forums that discuss the advantage. And this is another big problem, you see. If you can't be on the right if you can't be with the Christians and the racists and the 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 one percent businessmen who are the richest in the world, that's the Republican Party. If you can't be with the elephant, then you have then everybody else goes to the donkey. Everyone else goes to the donkey. And the thing is, you know, it's so interesting how when Quran uses a word, it is so true in describing the situation. So you have Ashabul Fil, but the Ashabul Fil have elephants have a herd mentality. Everyone on the Republican side is actually united on ideas. The Democratic Party, because you have the atheist sitting with the religious social activist, right, sitting with the gay person, and they all, these little groups, they got their little agendas with, you know, in this ball of groups of people that none of them really agree, agree with each other, and like the donkey, the donkey is not a herd animal. It just stands there by itself, right? And so everybody in the Democratic Party is like, you know, just, just on, on their own. They just come together to vote, and then that's it. All right, let's see what Sheikh Umar Suleiman says. Advancement of family values, social order, <laughs> wholesome morality, etc., with authentic paradigms. So this is kind of on the right of the aisle now, okay? So I'm, I'm doing a... Um, I'm doing a panel with uh, J.D. Greer, who's the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, so basically the most imp important person amongst evangelicals right now at NC State. Um, Neighborly Faith is an evangelical Muslim initiative. We should, if we have people that are sensible, that are willing to talk, that are willing to discuss these issues with us, we don't, sh we don't shut the door on anybody. Say, so, all right, let's talk. 
Let's get together. We should engage these forums. Can I have five? Absolutely, absolutely. If people are willing to talk, we're willing to talk, of course. But again, social movement versus political movement, and I think there's a big difference between the two. Five minutes, Sheikh. We'll do for, where's Mubina? All right, I'm sorry. All right, let me run through this. So what's our, here's some things to consider. What's our unique intervention to society? What are our legitimate solutions to society's legitimate problems that often get hijacked by illegitimate agendas? Uh, how do we differentiate between well-meaning individuals and big agendas? When people come to the masjid to support you as allies from any community, don't assume that they're part of some grand agenda and scheme to ruin you. All right? Most people are just well-meaning individuals, right, that you can talk to and not cast an entire assumption of them. Uh, what usually happens in the political world, and I've seen this very closely, um, is that is that not that they don't care, but you're just not on the priority list. They might even agree with you, but just because they agree with you doesn't mean that they're going to, um, you know, do what you want because you're just not a priority. Number one, number two, um, yes, the Muslim community voted for me. For example, if somebody says yes, Muslim community voted for me, but the Hispanic community is much larger, and I have to first do what they want, right? Or, I, or the black community that voted for me, I have to do, I have to fulfill their 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 needs first before the Muslim community. So. Um, they are well-meaning, and we should still talk to them. Being a part of these great agendas. Find balanced voices to work with on different uh, sides of the spectrum. Voices like Reverend William Barber, who champions the Poor People's Campaign. And if I'm being consistent, Arthur Brooks on the... Cons and over here, I want to mention, Quran specifically talks about a kind of like a working model with especially the Ahlul Kitab, right? Uh, so there's no there's no problem with that. But the problem is when your own identity as a group is at risk, then you have to save the identity of the group. You have to work on saving the identity of the group first. Right? And if you're going to do things in the political world that's going to compromise the identity of the group, the subgroup, the subculture, then that that is a big risk you're taking conservative side who who talks about social justice from a conservative perspective and then this is what i'm going to end with a long time i got a lot of i didn't even get to the problems part i just built the framework all right i'm just going to read this part inshallah all right put the pressure on in the space that you are in if the people that you're with within a coalition or an idea ideate in a certain direction that's positive so there's obviously something positive that brings us to the table there's some things that we don't overlap in but we're sitting with people, we're working towards this goal that is positive. If you're with people that ideate in a certain direction that's positive, push them to be consistent with their claims. What does that mean? When I'm in a liberal setting and people identify as... I'll just stop right here. This is a very important point. It's true, but what does the Quran tell us about the donkey? The party of the donkey, the people of the donkey, the people that are... Most like the donkey, they never do what they know. They have a lot of books, a lot of ideas, a lot of knowledge, a lot of sophisticated words, but they don't, they will not ever do. Ever, 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 the Democratic Party will never actually do what they claim they want to do which is why so many blacks have become republicans because the democratic party has been voting i mean the black community has been voting democrats for i don't know what 20 30 40 years now and what have they got what has the hispanic community got well muslims will get even less than that and so you can point out their their inconsistencies But it's not going to do anything. That's just the reality. Progressives, why do you exclude Palestine? Do you know people have left the Democratic Party to the Republican Party because the Democratic Party didn't do anything for them? And they went to the Republican Party thinking that, yeah, let us go to the Republican Party so that the Democratic Party realizes that what an asset we can be for them if they actually do what we want. 
Why are you progressive on everything except for Palestine? If you're talking about cages in the border, where are you on Gitmo and Abu Ghraib and the torture chambers of the American government that put Muslims exclusively in these places? If you're talking about policing, why aren't you talking about militarism? Right? Why aren't you talking about the bombardment and the, and, and the devastation of the Muslim world? And by the way, if I'm in a liberal setting, you're going to always hear me bring those issues up because it makes people uncomfortable, but I challenge them on their consistency. So you don't want me to talk about Afghanistan and the bombing of the pine farmers? You want me to take that out of my speech? Why? Explain it to me. So challenge them. If I'm in a conservative setting, push them to consistency. Your insistence on morality is wonderful. Why is it that you treat a man who bragged about grabbing women by the private parts as if he's Jesus? or the Messiah, right? Your insistence on the sanctity of the baby is wonderful. The, the, the unborn, right? And the fetus, and not treating it like a lump of flesh. We have similar ideas. Um, not, not quite to the right, but we're somewhere in the center there. But we, we agree on the sanctity of that child. Uh, it's a ruh, it's a spirit, fine. Um, but how come that doesn't translate into black and brown babies once they're actually born? You insist on religious freedom. What about the Uyghurs? What about the, the largest mass atrocity in the world right now infringing upon people for uh, their religion? So I've worked with conservatives on that, on that issue, and as well as the Rohingya issue, and I have no shame about that whatsoever. Conditional allyship should be rejected. Often our, con our ideas of conditional allyship are imagined. Meaning what? And I'm going to end with this, inshallah ta'ala. Allah almost time. I'll get to the other stuff at some point. Probably have to develop this into a longer talk. But I want to end on this point. Stop being so insecure with yourself. When you articulate yourself intelligently, compassionately, sensitively, when you build relationships with people, you'd be surprised how understanding people will actually be when you sit with them. <laughs> and you explain to them where you are. That is absolutely true, but the person you're talking to will be sensitive to you. So if somebody's gay and you're sitting with them and talking to them, that gay person may feel, yeah, you know, maybe Muslims aren't so bad. But the youth that are seeing you engage in that, it's not so good for them. On certain issues, and you don't do it in a social media-ish type way. Especially if you're present for khair, especially if you're present for good. Then it'll make those ideas of tension more palatable to people that otherwise would throw them out the door or assume that they come from the same harsh-hearted place as their opponents in society. Don't be so insecure with yourself. I have never, never been asked to relinquish the Sunnah, to relinquish my positions on anything by anyone in Dallas, except on the issue of Palestine, by the way, unfortunately, multiple times. But on this issue of LGBT, on the issue of Muslim uh, morality or social, no LGBT group has ever told me, you can't be here because you hold this view. No one says that to, to me. No one has ever, you know, you can have thoughtful conversation people. No one has said that to you because they know that you're a Muslim Imam who has hundred thousands of followers and you're gonna get the party to win if, if you do your job. And so we're gonna tolerate you. People just like you can at work, right? If you are able to be secure with yourself and, and, and show and, and express those things compassionately, sensitively. It's not about being secure with yourself. It's about how the insecure, which is the majority of the Muslims who changed their name from Muhammad to Mo, right? Who uh, maybe wears hijab at home, but does, takes it off when she's in college. Those insensitive people, they will be affected negatively when you are, uh, you have these broad coalitions and alliances with with people that in in all the other issues don't agree with you, essentially, and that's the problem with the Democratic Party. It's a group of people that basically can never be on the same page, you know. Whereas the Republican Party is very united compared to the Democratic Party. <coughs> now authentically inshallah ta'ala so we show people the beauty of the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and we pray that those are the elements that shine and that allow us to navigate those tensions a little bit better now over here i want to end with something very important especially when it comes to gays and lesbians you know the democratic party the donkey party you know the the jan the messiah is going to come on, the, on a donkey you know this right He's going to sit on a donkey and come on a donkey. But 
the Democratic Party is the most godless party. Most godless party. And there are three elements you could say that I was mentioning a few, but I want to bring it together. You have the LGBT on the one side. You have the, the, the Jewish influence with the Democrats. You have the atheistic influence on the other side. And you have these are the three pillars of the Democratic Party. And then you have all these other um, groups that, you know, that, uh, that come with them because they're minorities, basically. You know, whether it's the blacks, the Hispanics, the, some of these social activist churches that Sheikh Umar Suleiman was talking about, the Muslims are going to be part of this, the Sikhs are going to be part of this, so on and so forth. Okay? Now, I want to end with this. Instead of this, what we need to do is to explain, or, 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 or what I'm trying to say here is, is that I want to explain to you why this this problem of of lgbt is a why is it a problem it's a problem because it goes against human it's it's something that is it is it is against human nature why do people become gay this is what i want to talk about you see there is a a and there are many books on this now that have explained this and robert cohen who was a professor at georgetown university has written a book out it about it called coming out straight is the name of the book. I actually took a course with him, Robert Cohen, coming out straight. Okay, when you are at a certain age, when you're young, right, you want to be with the people of your gender, and you say, oh, the girls have cooties. I want to be with the guys. I just want to hang out with the guys. And the girls, they want to be with themselves, and the guys, they want to be with themselves. And at that phase, at that mental, the psyche, the, the that that phase of the human being, if you don't have a sense of belonging with the manhood or with the female, right? If you don't really bond with your gender, because that's that phase where you have to bond with your gender. And you grow older and now you're teenagers and now your hormones are running and you have this, you know, these hormones. And so that need for that bond and those hormones, the sexual hormones, they get, it becomes confusing. And so what happens, a, a guy starts thinking, oh, you know, I need to bond with this guy, right? And, and then he has these hormones, and so he, it, it becomes like a, a sexual perversion. And so I've had many cases, and you can even look up uh, my YouTube videos on this issue of uh, curing homosexuality and so on and so forth. And it's such, when we're talking about harm to society, I mean... We really need to make it clear as Muslims and, and take a, st a strong stand on this issue that if you end up killing people in the name of love, right? You go to bed with someone and now he gets AIDS and then he gets, a he gets a HIV, then he gets AIDS and he dies in the name of love. If we're doing this as a society, if we're allowing this as a society, that we're allowing people to die in the name of love, this is a big part, problem. See, the problem is, the problem is that when you have political, now this is very, very important what I'm about to say. When you have political alliances with others, they should know clearly where you stand. So if, you, if the, then it is them coming to us. If I explain to the LGB community, look, this is what we think. We think you're killing people. This is why the Islamic punishment is what? Because death for death. So if I explain to them, look, this, this is what our view is about this issue in which we disagree with you. We can work with you on these issues, but we disagree with you on this issue and we actually make it clear and we actually make it perfectly clear. And as a, as a, you can even consider it as a part of our, uh, uh, you could say uh, grassroots social justice movement. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's only half of the issue. The other half of the issue is that the Muslims that are are the spectators that are watching you, they're not clear where you stand. They're not clear where you where you how you're thinking and 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 so therefore. You know, if when you are involved in the political world, 
And the, even the Muslims are not clear, what are you exactly thinking? They're going to think all sorts of things, negative and positive. But the worst of it will be the Muslim youth looking at you and say, hey, this sheikh, he sits with these people, and, and he's okay with these uh, LGBT people. And yet, you have not talked in these so many years of sitting with the LGBT people about the Islamic view or your view about where you disagree with them. So then this becomes a problem. So inshallah, I will end here and I would like to see what your feelings and your comments are and, and, and what the good things Shaykh Omar Suleiman said, maybe some things good I said, you know, what are your reflections, what are your thoughts and <coughs> I will put a link to a chat room in which we can have this discussion also in the description area. I will have a link for the uh, chat room, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and then whoever wants to go there can have discussions with other people on this issue. And I'd like to, I think it might be interesting if people actually comment on this issue. And uh, and please share, subscribe, get my ideas to Sheikh Omar Suleiman. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.